This is the story of St. Patrick. So my friends, St. Paddy's Day is nearly upon us. Maybe you've bought a massive green hat, maybe you've stocked up on Guinness and you're getting ready for a celebration. But today I would like to explore the legend, the mythos of St. Patrick, patron saint of Ireland. So St. Patrick is a really interesting figure because he sits at a sort of um, intersection between earlier Irish mythology and the tales of gods and heroes and the later legends of the saints and sort of Irish history. He's kind of a linchpin, a bridge between pagan Ireland and the Christian present. So I'm going to tell you the story of St. Patrick now. It's not going to be really a historical narrative, it's going to be more of a legendary narrative. And I would like to take you to the place where St. Patrick banished all the snakes from Ireland, which is a real place. It's called Crow Patrick. I went there last year. So I'd like to take you there and show you that. And then I'd like to share a sort of personal story of something that happened to me there and sort of maybe ask what St. Paddy's Day is really about, if we're maybe interested in the old ways, including early Christianity and what came before it. So, St. Patrick was not Irish. St. Patrick was a Briton. He was from Roman Britain and his parents were aristocrats. They had a villa somewhere on the west coast of Britain, maybe Cornwall, maybe Wales. Now, in terms of history, this was during the collapse of the Roman Empire. So newly Christian Britain at the far ragged edge of the Roman Empire had tumbled into chaos. Invaders were sweeping in from all directions. The Saxons were sweeping in from the east. The Picts and Scots were pouring over Hadrian's Wall from the north. And of course, the Irish pirates were coming in from the west across the sea and raiding the western coast, just as the Scandinavians were raiding the eastern coast. It was a chaotic time to exist. It must have seemed like the world was on fire. A little bit like today, maybe. Now, St. Patrick was plucked up from his parents' villa on the coast and whisked away to Northern Ireland, the place where my ancestors are from. He was in Ulster, somewhere between the shores of Loch Nee and the mountains. So he was forced to be a shepherd for many, many long years, five or six years. He had to tend his master's flock, come rain or sun, bears or wolves he had to endure and he was very very lonely and often terrified and he turned during those long lonely windswept nights to the religion of his childhood it was christianity a very new newfangled religion and he would pray night after night after night for strength and deliverance then one night on a windswept bit of hill below his flock he had a dream. The dreamer, a voice from on high saying, your salvation is coming soon. A ship will come and take you away back to Britain. A few days later he had another dream. It was simply this, your ship is ready. Go now, leave the flock, go to the sea. <laughs> so he did. He went to the ocean and there, sure enough, down in the glistening bay, a ship was waiting, bobbing. He ran down to it and spoke to the captain and the crew and asked if he could come aboard. At first, the captain and the crew chased him away. <laughs> it was clear he was a runaway slave and it would not be good to business. It would not be good for business to uh, steal the property of his uh, prospective clients. They chased him away and then St. Patrick, he got down on his knees and he began to pray. And as he did so, there was a call from the ship. The crew were calling him over. Clearly, they had changed their minds. So, Patrick went on board, and down in the hold, a strange cargo. 
oh, the whole thing was filled with Irish wolfhounds that were on their way to markets in Gaul, where they would fetch a very good price as guard dogs. So packed in his hold full of dogs, Patrick prayed for safety and those dogs did not harm him. On the way, there was a terrible storm, a terrible storm, and all the sailors were terrified. The dogs started biting each other and the crew, and they thought they would be lost. And Patrick said in his young naivety and faith, do not worry, do not worry, for my God will deliver us. And on deck, windswept, he began to pray, and those storms quietened right down, right down. The ocean was still as glass, and they were carried to a coast. They had been blown far off course. They were not in Britain, they were in Gaul. And when they disembarked, they found that every village and every community had been laid to waste. Clearly there had been a raid, a pirate raid across the coast, and everything, village and crop, had been set on fire. The crew rounded on Patrick. They were angry. They had no one to sell their goods to. They could not buy any food. They were going to starve. And they turned to him and said, where is your God now? Hmm? And Patrick, again, in his faith and perhaps his naivety, got down on his knees and prayed for deliverance from the Lord. Sure enough, in that moment, there was a cloud of dust over a nearby horizon. And along the road came a whole herd of pigs. Obviously its herder had been slain and they had nowhere to go and they were coming right for that crew who managed to catch a couple and skinned them and cooked them and ate them and some of them, half of the crew, were so impressed they converted to Christianity there and then. <laughs> and that, according to Patrick's own confessions, was the beginning of his evangelism. He parted from the crew at some point and made his way to various churches and monasteries throughout Gaul. And he learned more about his faith and he decided that he would become a member of the clergy. And he did so. And in that guise, he returned to Britain all the way back to his home, his home, his ancestral home. When his dear mother and father saw that Patrick was alive and well and a bishop. Wonder fell upon them. They thought they were in a dream. A boy is back after all these years. Ah, it was like the bells. Things were good. Things were good for a time. And Patrick thanked the Lord for his deliverance and perhaps a respectable career in the clergy <laughs> awaited him safe in the remains of Roman Britain. But things were not to last long. Patrick had another dream, another big dream. In it, a ship, another ship was sailing from Ireland and out of it came a man, a man whose name was Victoricus, and he had with him letters. And on the letters was written a header, the voice of the Irish, and crying out as if in one voice were many lamentations of people he used to know back when he was a slave, a lowly herder in the wilds of the north of Ireland. And they were saying, come back, Patrick, please walk again among us. We too need to be saved. Wow, if you have that kind of dream, my friends, you do not ignore it. And Patrick made ready, got permission from the ecclesiastical authorities <laughs> to journey over and convert the pagan Irish. Obviously, his parents were very, very, very distraught at this. They had just got their son back. But Patrick knew it was his destiny. It was written in the soul of the world, or so the legend goes. So Patrick sailed over with a small, very small group of monks <clears throat> over a stormy sea, and he arrived not far, not far at all from when he had fled Ireland all that time before. And he sat for a while on a burial mound or near a burial mound, a certain 
stone circle and mound, a place where the locals kept away from. It was a place of the ancestors, a place of the she, the others. Now Patrick and his small band of monks was just sat here when two young women of a nearby village came by to get water. And they looked at Patrick, simple as they were, and his monks, and they were amazed. And they asked, are you of the other world? What are you? Are you of the burial mound? Are you people of the Shi? Are you gods? <laughs> or ghosts? And Patrick said neither, and said, I am the follower of the one true God. And these young women asked Patrick, well, what is the nature of your God? You know, where does he reside? Does he live in the sky, in the mountains, trees, rivers and hills? Or does he live under the earth? <laughs> Well, Patrick started to answer all these questions. He said, none of these. My God created the sky and the rivers and the hills and the earth. These two uh, naive young women were so entranced by the strange things this strangely dressed man was saying that they agreed to be converted there and then and were baptised in the water. They were his first two converts on Irish soil. But, my friends, <laughs> this was a... Um, foreshadowing of things to come because those two were the daughters of a local chief and he was very very displeased that his two young daughters had been turned away from the old ways the old gods patrick went and confronted this chieftain to speak with him but the chieftain would have none of it and he unleashed one of his great two of his great wolfhounds to tear patrick to pieces and they ran towards him but Patrick showed no fear. He remembered the time in the bowels of that ship surrounded by wolfhounds, and he just calmed those two wolfhounds. They became completely still. This reminds me in an ep of an episode of the um, story of the Buddha, where he calms a charging elephant with his, with his um, metta, with his loving kindness, his friendliness. Very similar, very similar thing. He calmed these two wolfhounds down, and the chieftain himself and his men took up arms and ran to Patrick. Patrick spoke a word, and they became turned to statues. A miraculous act of power. <laughs> Patrick was overcome with remorse, though, that he had turned this chieftain and his men to stone, and went up and touched his feet, and wept, and the tears fell upon the feet of those statues and the dogs licked up the salty tears and gradually that chieftain turned back into living form and so grateful and overjoyed and overawed was he that he too converted to Christianity and so did his tribe. But you see this is the story of St Patrick. It was piecemeal. The conversion was slow. Tribe by tribe, kingdom by kingdom, petty chieftain by pe petty chieftain. Some embraced Christianity. It was a breath of fresh air against the oppression of the old gods that lusted for blood. But others clung firmly to the ancestral ways. Who can blame them? Maybe. Gradually, St. Patrick made his way round the north coast of Ireland to the west, down what we now call the Wild Atlantic Way. Eventually, he came to a place called the Reek, a sacred mountain. And he ascended that mountain, and just like Moses on top of Mount Sinai, he fasted on top of it for 40 days and 40 nights. And he confronted many demons, just like Jesus in the desert. One night, a huge flock of black birds came and tried to peck him all to death, and he flung them away. One night, uh, a great black serpent slithered out of the loch below and tried to devour him, but he plucked it up and banished it back down into the waters below where it still remains to this day. Another day, a demon came with his daughters and attempted to lure Patrick with thoughts of lusty things. Again, just like the story of the Buddha under the Bodhi tree and the daughters of the demon king, Mara. Similar parallels here. Well, at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, Patrick had enacted some piece of Christian magic that banished all of the snakes from Ireland and reached a covenant with God that he would indeed convert all of the Irish to Christianity. And on the last day of judgment, he would be the one to decide their fate.
<laughs> Later interpretation, you might say. But when Patrick descended the reek, descended that sacred mountain, that, that seat of druidry and the old gods, he was changed, he was transformed, he was glowing. People could tell and people converted there, left, right and centre. All people started to follow Patrick and this new god, this new <laughs> druid who had come with this new Christ, the druid of Galilee. <laughs> and they followed him, they followed him. And then Patrick went straight to the centre of Ireland, straight to the palace of the High Kings. Patrick went to Tara and it was Beltane. <laughs> the fire festival and all the fires were lit on the hills and the high king and the high king's arch druids had commanded that all the fires on all the surrounding hills must be put out so the great fire at Tara could be lit and then they could all be lit again so one by one this Beltane all the fires started to go out all around all was going well according to the decrees of the druids and wizards of the old ways one fire one fire on a hill nearby did not go out. It got larger and larger and larger. And the High King of Ireland and sense said, Who dares? Who dares keep their Beltane fire lit? And the Druids consulted each other. It was woeful news. And they said, This fire must be put out now. Because if it is not put out now, it will never be put out. And all of our old ways will be forgotten. Well, the uh, High King's men and the warriors went and got Patrick from that hill and extinguished the fire and brought all those druids and Patrick, all those monks and Patrick in chains before the High King. <laughs> and he was threatened with death there on the spot. And Patrick showed no fear. <laughs> and he spoke to the king directly and said, you on this day, Beltane, worship the sun. But I tell you, my God created the sun. <laughs> and the moon and the stars and the earth he was there at the beginning and he will be there at the end i answer to him <laughs> and he has created eternal life and if you kill me no now death holds no fear such were his words <laughs> that many in the assembled company converted there and then now Say what you will about the Irish, but if someone's got the gift of the gab, the gift of speech, they earn respect. And Patrick had that. So the king, he did not convert, but he did allow Patrick and his monks to live. You see, he was fearful. There had been a prophecy. The Druids knew of it years before that a group of men with heads like adzes, <laughs> shaven tonsures, and hooded cloaks and crooked staffs would sail over the stormy sea, <laughs> and there they would begin to multiply and multiply and multiply, and their new faith would cover all of Ireland. <laughs> there was nothing that could be done. It was written. So that's a sort of rough <laughs> hagiography of Patrick, uh, partly taken from his own accounts, partly taken from other uh, later um, sort of Christian medieval writers in Ireland. Obviously take it with a pinch of salt. Um, a lot of other stuff is filled with kind of Christian vitriol against the old ways. So I've sort of pick and mixed that one a little bit. But there's another really interesting story about St. Patrick, which as I said at the beginning of this video, really links him in with earlier mythology and later history. So this story takes place, you know, towards the end of Patrick's career. Christianity has been sort of well established. There are various churches and monasteries throughout Ireland. Uh, and one of them, the main monastery, <laughs> the old pagans derisively called it the House of the Bells because of those bells. You know, it's a monastery like this one. So one day, a wild man came to the monastery, the house of the bells, the house of St. Patrick. <laughs> he was ancient, beard stretching all the way down to the ground, bent double. But even though he was bent double, he was still a head and shoulders taller than any other man. <laughs> and he would eat all the appetite that he had. He poured scorn on the thin gruel of the monks. He poured scorn on their weak, 
ale. And he would say, in the old days, a quarter of a blackbird would have been bigger than your side of venison. A rowan berry would have been bigger than your loaf of bread. Hell, the juice from that rowan berry would have been bigger than your tankard of mead, you pitiful monks. You lie, old man, <laughs> said one of the monks. And then a great hot anger fell on this old man, and he rose up and grasped the skull of this monk who was about to crush it. Peace, said Patrick. <laughs> I do not lie. <laughs> the days of the Fianna were so much finer than these dry days of you monks and your psalms and your chanting and your dreary bells and your poor, poor music and your worse poetry. <laughs> the Fianna, the legendary heroes of Ireland, had been dead for hundreds of years. How could this man know anything of the days of the Fianna? Well, it just so happened that this old man was Oshin, <laughs> Oshin, the son of the deer. Oshin, the son of Finn McCool himself, who had been across the sea through a doorway in a fairy wind to the land of Tir Nano. If you're familiar with Irish mythology and the Fenian cycle, you'll know the story of Oshin and Nave, who go over the sea into the land of the ever young, Tir Nano. I've told it on this channel, I'll put a link to it. But to cut a long story short, Oshin has a family and everything is wonderful in the land of in the land of eternal youth but he longs for home <laughs> and he goes back to ireland on a horse riding across the ocean and he's told by his wife not to let a foot touch irish soil or he can never return home sadly he does and just then he ages hundreds of years and becomes an old man and that is how the monks found him and he is taken to saint patrick of course, Patrick and the monks don't believe his story. It's highly unbelievable. But then Oshin, he, with the help of a young boy to act as his eyes, goes to one of the old hideouts, one of the old um, longhouses of the Fianna, which is now just a burial mound surrounded by stones, a haunted place. And he begins to dig and dig and dig. And then he pulls out this great cauldron, this big feasting bowl that was used to cook venison or warm mead. And he takes it to the House of the Bells, the monastery of St. Patrick, and throws it on the table and says, there, you know, breaks the table, it's huge, and says, now, you see, I do not lie. And Patrick says, to his credit, I see, you do not lie. You are Oshin, son of Finn. Now, tell us the stories of the Fianna. <laughs> and there, Oshin began to tell all the tales of the Fianna, of Finn McCool, of the legends of the of the Fianna and the monks begin to furiously write them down and, and then they are now published in various books <laughs> like this for us all to read. <laughs> so my friends, that is how, uh, according to traditional narratives, the old stories of Irish mythology came to be in our possession. They were passed on by Oshin over his tongue into the ears of St. Patrick and recorded by monks for us to read today. So that is the way in which earlier the pagan imagination of Ireland is connected to the later literary tradition of Christian Ireland via the bridge, the device of Oshin and St. Patrick. So just something to think about there. So St. Patrick and the snakes. <laughs> This is uh, one thing that most people know about St. Patrick, isn't it? That he supposedly banished all the snakes from Ireland. Obviously, it's not true. Ireland has never had any snakes for geological reasons. But it's kind of always been taken as an allegory for banishing the pagan ways and the old gods from Ireland. Again, I would say this, this kind of puts Patrick in the lineage of dragon slayers, serpent vanquishers in Indo-European mythology. Think of Indra, think of Zeus, think of Thor. They're all serpent slayers. Good overcoming evil and paganism is evil. Dragons, ah. 
but he doesn't slay the snakes, he banishes them. Slightly different thing. But there's also another layer, I would argue, is going on here. And this could be symbolic on another layer, because he doesn't really banish the old ways. He kind of incorporates them into Christianity. This is why Christianity really took off in Britain and Ireland, is it? Because it kind of incorporated the old Druidic belief system. So there is a historic place connected with this supposed act of serpent banishment, this act of ritual magic. It's called Crow Patrick. It's called the Reek. Now, I went on a pilgrimage here last year, and there's a bit of a story I've got attached to this. It begins in a strange way. We were somewhere in the north of Ireland uh, at where we met a, another traveller, an Irish lady, a sort of fairy lady, a gypsy lady, who had told us of this mountain, Crow Patrick, which I hadn't heard of before, and said, she said, you must go there. Her name is Sarah Humble. She does great work. She uh, repairs fairy wells all over Ireland, sacred wells. I'll put a link to her website, actually. So she drew a little map for us and said, you must go to Crow Patrick. And uh, that set the seed for me. So it set a kind of a, a pilgrimage end point for me. And we drove to this um, a village at the foot of this mountain and me and Tamsin and the, do and the dog were going to climb this mountain uh, but there was a sign at the foot of it saying any dogs on the mountain will be shot without question quite aggressive um, apparently some dogs have been savaging some farmers sheep so after seeing this sign Tam didn't want to go any further with Nero fair enough so she went home um, and I decided that I would climb this mountain alone which worked out quite well in the end, but to be honest, that sign had made me quite angry and it put some kind of demons in my head. I'll put it this way, I was imagining various scenarios where the farmer shoots the dog and obviously I've usually got a knife with me for whittling, so I was thinking how, has he got one or two barrels on that shotgun? If he's got one, then obviously I can dispatch him quite easily and leave him on the mountainside. If he's got two, then obviously, you know, he's got a shot at me, but then I can gut him, maybe get his wallet, find out where he lives, kill his family. That seems fair for killing my dog. And then I'm thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you do? Obviously, I've been plagued by demons, by serpents. Um, so I just treat this as a religious experience and go and um, baptise myself in the water. And... and um, centre myself because it was a strange thing for me that to be thinking these kind of violent thoughts especially on a holy mountain but as I climb the mountain more and more stillness kind of falls on me and then I get to the top of the mountain and this great cloud comes over the top of the mountain like that flock of black birds that Patrick supposedly um, had to fight off wind swept mountain and then it clears and then the sky opens and i feel really um reborn actually and i'm walking down that mountain and i realized as i was w climbing that mountain i wanted to banish a lot of these demons a lot of these serpents but actually that just makes them come back double strong uh, we know this from mythology that's always the way when you throw a serpent out uh, often it inhabits a river or a well and comes back as a dragon many years later, comes back into our life to devour us. So it's better to get those snakes, those demons, out of that long black bag we drag behind us and kind of, and kind of build them a room in our inner castle, if that makes sense psychologically. So that's sort of what I did on top of that mountain, and I came back having made peace with those snakes, with those demons. And maybe that's a better message to take forward. We don't slay demons. We don't banish demons. We have to find a way to uh, live peaceably with them because they are a part of our human shadow. So that's sort of... Um, that's sort of a personal take on this story of St. Patrick that I wanted to leave you with. Um, and maybe, maybe that's a way we should approach a lot of the problems that, that we face in the world today. Um, there's too much polarisation in the world. 
I'm right, you're wrong, everything here is good, everything out there is evil, that sets up a lot of problems psychologically, um, spiritually, politically. So um, forgive, forgive your demons and accept them, they're part of you. That's my St. Patrick's Day message. I'm going to leave you with a poem. This poem sort of encapsulates the encounter of Oisin with Patrick in the House of the Bells. There was a time when I thought, sweeter than the quiet converse of monks, the cooing of the ring dove flitting about the pool. There was a time when I thought, sweeter than the sound of the little bell beside me, the warbling of the blackbird from the gable and the belling of the stag in the storm. There was a time when I thought, sweeter the howling of wolves than the voice of a priest indoors, baaing and bleating. <laughs> Though you like your ale with ceremony in the drinking halls, I like better to snatch a drink of water in my palm from a spring. Though you like the fat and meat which are eaten in the drinking halls, I like better to eat a head of clean watercress in a place without sorrow. Clearly, Lament for the Old Ways by a early 12th century Irish monk. That's from this book, Celtic Miscellany. On that note, have a great St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Enjoy a good drink, but remember to get outside and enjoy nature too, and embrace an older version of Christianity. <laughs> or not. It's up to you. See you later.